Over the last few weeks, if you have not been here, we've been talking about a very famous dreamer. Maybe you've heard of him before. His name is Joseph, and he received a dream and a destination from God. And something that I've been preaching to you guys over the last couple of weeks is this, is that you too, as believers in Christ, guess what? You got a dream and you have a destination from the Lord to step into something you were created for. Ephesians chapter two, verse 10 states it like this. We have become his poetry, a recreated people, listen to this, that will fulfill the destiny that he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one, the son of God, even before we were born. Listen to this, I love this. God planned in advance our destiny and the good works that we would do to fulfill it. Meaning God created you for a purpose. Don't ever let the devil lie to you and say you were created for no reason, that you have no purpose. Don't let people come into your life and speak condemnation over your life and tell you that you're nobody, that you're going nowhere, that nothing's gonna happen for your life because that is a lie from the devil because right here, by the word of God, God is saying, I created you. In my image, that's what the Lord is speaking. And I created you for a purpose to impact everybody around you so the devil wants to stop you from making that impact to see how good the Lord is. How many of y'all would love for your dream to become a reality? The dreams that you have. There's one thing though I wanna show you, okay? We all want the dreams to be fulfilled, but we cannot miss what was spoken over Joseph in Psalms chapter 105, verse 19. This is where it gets a little tricky, okay? Listen to this. Until the time came, To fulfill his dreams, the Lord made sure Joseph's life was comfortable, easy. Everything just flowed well, no conflict, no confrontation, just a lot of blessings, right? No, that's not what it says at all. It says, until the time came to fulfill the dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. Why does the Lord test our character? Why is it? Because he's preparing your character for the position. And if you remember on the second week of the series, I told you that there are things that are created to be tested to make sure it's ready to be used for its purpose. So let me say it like this. You will see some tests in your life. God will challenge your character to make sure it's time for you to be used for your created purpose. Because each and every one of us has a created purpose from the Lord. But what happens if you rush the process? If we were to be honest with each other, how many of us struggle also with some patience? Let's be honest, I don't like to be patient. I don't like to wait on the Lord. And sometimes we try to rush the process. What happens when we rush things? We mess it up, right? We get things out of whack and we go too fast. And so we mess up some of the relationships in our life or even the job promotions that we thought we would have. In fact, for some of us, we've stepped into a position with pride, right? And for some of us, we stepped into that position. We said, look at my talents and look what I can do. I did this for myself, but... According to the word of God, you better be careful because that pride will cause a fall. (laughs) Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction. You will destroy yourself thinking that it's all in your control and not the Lord's. Trying to do things your way and not the Lord's way. So pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. And pride is also a characteristic of the devil. Do you understand that? to think that you can uh, accomplish all these things on your own. And so the Lord knows that there may be some things that need to be tweaked. (laughs) There may be some things in your life right now that you need to learn to get your character ready for the position. So because he is a, listen, a loving father who wants you not only to step into your destination, but to succeed, to see success in your life, he will challenge you. He'll allow tests in your life to put together the character you need for the position in the end. Now, let me show you something out of James chapter four, verse 10. Okay, I wanna show you a revelation out of this today. James chapter four, verse 10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord. Submit yourselves over to the Lord and he will do what? He will exalt you, okay? That's what the text says. The word exalt also means that God will give you a promotion. Humble yourself before the Lord and God will give you a promotion. Humble yourself before the Lord and God will also give you a position of authority, a position of power when your character is ready, okay? Series really getting into this uh, message today. All right, so the title of today's message is this. I wanna talk about the power test. 
the power test. Okay, we've been talking about a lot of different tests over the last few weeks as well. And some of y'all thought the purity test was hard. Some of y'all thought the uh, provision test was hard or believed the impossible test was hard. But I'm telling you, some of the biggest challenges that come into your life are the moment you step into a position of success. Because then your character is really gonna be challenged. And how you make decisions, you either honor the Lord or you honor yourself. And people are gonna notice your character from the outside. So I wanna teach you today that um, all authority and power is given to us by who? By God, all right? but you need to learn how to manage well what the Lord has given you for you to step into that position. And for a lot of us, we have management problems. We have behaviors that we haven't learned how to change and how to rely on the Lord. So I wanna give you biblical, a biblical foundation today if you're struggling in this area. All right, so I got three points for you. Point number one is this. You must manage the small before you can manage the big. You must manage the small before you can manage the big. Now, what does that even mean? All right. Let me show you what Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, verse 10. He said, whoever can be trusted with these small things can also be trusted with the big things. But whoever is, listen to the wording here, dishonest with the little things will also be dishonest with the big things. What do we do with the Lord all the time? We're like, God, this is so small. Like, I don't like this position. I can't stand listening to everybody else. And God, I want my own thing. I want that, that promotion. I want everybody to see who I am. I want the money. I want the house. I want all these things, but I can't stand this. And the Lord is saying, if you can't handle the little things, then what makes you think I'm gonna give you something better down the road? Any parents in the room? Raise your hand. Um, well, my children, I give them tests sometimes with toys, right? I'll give them the cheaper toy. I remember my kids wanted to switch and we gave them like the, not the old school Game Boy, cause that's really cool, but like the in-between one that nobody cares about or remembers. And I gave them one of those. And one of my children, he took good care of it. It still works today. The other one in a week's time, it was done. <laughs> It was completely broken. So over time, I know who to reward and I'm gonna reward the other, but I wanna make sure he can handle the small things. Take care of those things. The Lord is saying the same thing because he's a good father. And he's saying, listen, I gave you something. You complained about it. You didn't want it. You didn't manage it properly. And so now you're begging me for something bigger when your character is not ready. You will mess it up. You'll rush the process. Okay, so let's, let's continue the story of where we left off. Uh, Joseph is, has been in the prison. He interpreted the dreams of these two men that were in the, the prison. One of them died and one of them was able to live. The baker was able to be, um, oh, sorry, the butler was able to be next to Pharaoh. Okay, here's what happened. Genesis chapter 41, verse eight and nine. The next morning, Pharaoh was very disturbed. Why was he disturbed? Because he had dreams. So he called for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt when Pharaoh told them his dreams. Not one of them could tell him what they meant. Finally, the king's chief cupbearer, the butler, spoke up and he said, today I have been reminded. Now, this is another perfect example of God working behind the scenes. You understand? Just because you're not seeing God work doesn't mean he's not working on your behalf. Because God was doing things behind the scenes. Remember what Joseph said to the butler? He said, remember me? <laughs> remember that I helped you with your dreams. I was able to interpret it. So can you put a little good word in for me? And the butler completely forgot, right? But here's what the Lord did. I, I sometimes wonder if the Lord laughs at us. Like you're trying to force something to happen. You're not ready. You're not ready. But later on, God gave Pharaoh a dream. And now he's looking for a man that had a destination to give an interpretation. And because of that, all of a sudden now the butler is reminded of Joseph. And so he said, I have been reminded of my failure, he told Pharaoh. Verse 12, there was a young Hebrew man with us in the prison who was a slave of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams and he told each of us what our dreams meant. So here's how they knew that he was a true prophet of, the God, of God because his interpretations were correct. Now, this got Pharaoh's attention. In verse 14, Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once, and he was quickly brought from the prison. Verse 15 and 16. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night, and no one here can tell me what it means, but I have heard that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. Listen to what Joseph said. Here's what he said. It's beyond my power to do this. 
I don't have the ability to interpret your dream, but my God can. <laughs> but Yahweh can, and my God can tell you what it means. And guess what? He can set you at ease, meaning my God can not only give you the interpretation, but he'll put peace in your heart. He'll put peace upon your mind. You're distressed, Pharaoh. You're anxious and you're afraid, but my Lord can speak and he brings peace upon your life. Do you understand if there was a moment for Joseph to humble brag, this was it. Like when he's asking Joseph, can you interpret my dreams? Joseph could have been like, yes, it is I. <laughs> yes, I can interpret your dreams. I will take all the silver and gold, please. And then I will give you an interpretation. He didn't do that. Many of us take credit for what only God has done. Even the talents that you have today, the business that you have today, the success that you have today, all good things come from God. All good things come from above. So everything that's been placed in your hands today has been given to you by a loving, good father. And sometimes we think that we did it, that we can do this, but listen, listen, you can be blessed today and you can still lose it all tomorrow. But when you trust God, you will never lose that trust and you will never lose your salvation in Jesus Christ if you keep following him, keep obeying him and what he has for you. He said, I can't do it, but my God can. All right, this is where the Lord started to really preach to me, okay? Um, I then realized that no matter what the environment looked like for Joseph, he did two things. The first thing that he did was always honor the Lord first. For a lot of us, that's, that's easier. Here's the hard part. The second thing he did, he honored the leadership over him every single time. No matter the environment, no matter how bad it was, he went from being a slave to a prisoner, yet he still honored the leadership that was placed over him because he understood, listen, he understood that these people had the power to move him forward into his destination or hold him back, meaning it really mattered how he responded in the moment to his leaders. Think about it. How you respond to your leaders matters to the Lord. In fact, let me say it like this, stepping into your destiny depends on how you respond to the leadership around you. And if you have a bad attitude, if you complain about everything, because let's be honest, you get told what to do. We don't like being told what to do. Most of us have some type of rebellion inside of us. And so people tell us what to do and you got to do that. And we're like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. But I, I want you to come to my church, okay? I would love for you to hear about the Lord, but I hate this job. You know what I mean? It's we speak such negativity over what the Lord has placed in our hands and the leadership around us when we're actually called to be under them for a time, maybe not always, but for a time to be a testimony of God's grace and goodness, which means also you must honor leadership to see your destiny fulfilled. Honor leadership to see your destiny fulfilled. Now, also when I say this, and this is why it's hard, some of us would say, hey, pastor, you don't know my boss. You don't know the leadership that is over me right now and the things that I have to hear throughout the week. There's no way that I want to honor this person. He doesn't honor me, right? Or these people in my life don't honor me or they're making decisions right now that are terrible. If I were in that position, but you're not. Why? God hasn't placed you there yet. And so if you're not in the position yet, there's a reason, <laughs> God is still working on your character. It doesn't mean you won't step into to the position, but right now, maybe God is testing your character with those around you coming into your life and speaking over you to do things you don't want to do. And I get that it's hard, but I want you to see something. Okay, and I'm definitely not saying this. Only obey somebody in authority over you as long as they're not asking you to do something against God, okay? If they're asking you to do something unbiblical, of course, honor the Lord first. Do not do what they're asking you to do. But if they're just asking you to do normal things, you're just don't wanna be there, don't wanna do this, don't wanna do that. Listen, you still have to honor the Lord. When you serve the Lord, you serve others. You honor the Lord and you honor others. Listen to this, Romans chapter 13, verse one. For all authority comes from God, not some of them. Not every now and then, but for all authority comes from God and those in position of authority have been placed there by God. Listen to the words of Jesus here. Now this one will get you. Matthew chapter 20, verse 26. 
Whoever wants to be a leader among you must get that degree and 10 years of experience and be a servant. Be a servant to the Lord. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others, the son of God. Jesus Christ came who had all power, all authority to make anything happen that he wanted for himself, but he came to show us how to serve, to love, because this is a testimony of God's grace that he saw us in our wickedness, in our rebellion. He said, I'm here to save you. I'm here to show you my love. I know that you think your way is better than my way, but it's not. And I will hold your hand. I'll take you a new way. And I'll show you that serving others is a way of serving the Lord. Honoring people is a way of honoring the Lord. But God, sometimes we say, I can't stand them. Let me ask you this question. Are they still created in the image of God? Does God still love them? Does God still want the best for them? What if you're meant to be the testimony that changes their life? What if they've never seen love before, but the way you handle them and handle their, their voice and the way they speak over you shows a testimony of God's goodness. Jesus was saying, listen, you wanna rule at the top, you have to learn to serve at the bottom. You wanna be at the top, you have to learn how to serve at the bottom. And so as I look at the story of Joseph, okay, I realized something else that was very important about Joseph. Joseph was always a good steward over what the Lord placed in his hands, no matter the environment. No matter where he was, he was blessing other people. He was a good steward as a slave. Genesis chapter 39, verse five. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house, talking about Potiphar, because of Joseph. So the Lord's blessings was on everything that Potiphar owned. Remember the story? Potiphar did not worry about anything except to eat. That was it. Joseph could have been like, you know what? I'm a slave. It doesn't matter anymore. I'm gonna do whatever I want here. I'm gonna break things, take things. Nobody's gonna know. But instead he managed the house properly, which also tells us this. Listen, sometimes God is gonna use you for a time to bring favor upon other people. The favor that the Lord has placed upon your life may be used for a season to bless other people, to bless other businesses, to bless other people's households, to be a testimony of God's grace. Because you know what's amazing about this story? Potiphar was an Egyptian man who worshiped the idols of Egypt. And later on, Pharaoh is an Egyptian man, of course, who worshiped the idols of Egypt, but both of them recognized the power of the one true God upon Joseph's life because of his character because he always honored God first and they honored the leadership that was over him. Listen, even as a prisoner, he managed the prison well. Genesis chapter 39, verse 23, the warden had no more worries. It's the same thing because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything that he did to succeed. Isn't it crazy that in the prison, God can still give you blessings? Do you see that in the story? Because so many of us are saying, God, if you just change my environment and give me everything I want, and God speaks in and says, but your heart won't change. I gotta change your heart here for you to see that I'll bless you here too. I'll change lives here too. Because if you're chasing money, if you're chasing status, if you're chasing a position, guess what? When you get it, it will not fulfill you. It will not satisfy you. You will still feel empty without your heart and character being changed because fullness comes from the Lord's presence. Favor comes from the Lord's presence. Stay in the Lord's presence. You stay in his favor and that favor changes your life forever. And you bless everybody around you. I think the greatest thing that God has allowed us to do by power and authority is to bless other people around us. It's a great feeling. But you know what happens? Sometimes we battle it in our head, like, should I? Should I not? I don't know. I need this. I don't know. And then the moment you do it, you feel, ah, you can breathe. And you feel the Lord doing something. And then that's how you start to see miracles in your own life. Because what it means, it means that you trust God. You trust that God will take care of your needs. But when you hold on to things, you're saying, God, I just don't trust you right now. I want to do what I want to do. And let me say it like this. 
when Joseph received a higher position, his heart remained humble and low because God worked on his character. When his position was high, his heart remained humble and low. He honored God as a slave, just like he did next to the king. Uh, Genesis chapter 41, verses 40 and 41, Pharaoh told Joseph, he said, listen, because you interpreted my dreams, we'll get into that in a second, you'll be in charge of my court. And all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a rank higher than yours. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. The destiny is about to be fulfilled. The promises of God, he's finally stepping into it. And now he has management over the entire land of Egypt. Now he has a position of success. This is what the Lord does. And so as I was reading the story, I was reminded of when my family moved here from Louisiana, okay? We had dreams about moving to North Carolina. Me and my wife both had dreams and we knew that the Lord was telling us to move out of here by faith. There was more confirmation in our life. God put a spiritual burden, that's the best way to express it, a spiritual burden on our hearts that we were to move. And so we moved out here by faith. And immediately I got the opportunity to be at a very large church out in, in, uh, in the Charlotte area. And I said, all right, Lord, because I knew that the Lord spoke over me that he would speak through me, that he would call me to be a preacher. And I've been a preacher for many years, about 15 years or so by now. And I'd been preaching on stages and, and evangelism and all these different things. And the Lord called me out here and I was so excited. I'm like, all right, God. So I knew I would be there for about six months. And I knew for six months, God was gonna train me to speak better. God was gonna train me to preach better. I was about to fulfill my destiny. Hand me the mic. That's what I said to the Lord. God says, here you go. I said, Lord, (laughs) this is not a mic, okay? Some of you are asking for the house. God gives you a broom. Some of you are asking for the new car. God gives you some Hot Wheels, you know? We ask for these things because of the dream and the destination that the Lord has shown us. And so I remember now, I just moved my whole family by faith, God. I know that I'm not making much. I know that it's gonna be a lot of faith to keep going. I thought I came here to learn how to preach better, but all I have in my hand is a broom. You told me you would train me for six months. And I'll never forget, I heard the Lord say, I am training you to be a better pastor. Now serve for six months. Without a platform, without a stage, without speaking, without any of it, here's a broom. How do you handle it? That was hard. I'm so thankful for it today, but it was so hard to go from speaking and preaching to taking care of the Lord's house in a way that nobody notices, nobody cares, sweeping, taking out the trash, doing a lot of intern work, to be honest with you. And I remember I said, Lord, but you called me out here by faith. You know what's crazy? God was testing my character. And in that moment, I didn't know then, but there were people in that building who watched me in that moment. And because of those people who watched me in that moment, they also gave me the opportunity to be here today. And the darkest time of my life when I felt like I was truly being humbled by the Lord, when I could have complained and griped about everything, when I could have said, you know what, God, I quit, I'm going back home. I'm going back to Louisiana. There were people in that building that would later give me the opportunity to be here today that would believe in the promises of God that would see me later planting a church and say, you know what? I remember him. I remember him at that church doing what he did. Let's give him a chance. Listen, right now, you may feel angry with God because of where you are. Right now, instead of the blessings and the big promise, you're holding something you never thought you would hold. But what if God is working on your character and other people are watching that's gonna play a big part in your destination and your purpose, but you just don't know it yet. And they're watching how you react and act during a trial because that's what matters most. That is a true testimony of God. 
Anybody can get on stage and be happy and good. But how do you act when people make you mad? <laughs> how do you act? Do you praise the Lord when people come after you and attack your character and who you are and everything that God has promised over your life? Man, I need you to understand today that serving God is a form of true worship. Why? Because you're pouring yourself out. You see that? When you serve the Lord, you're pouring out your own agenda, the things that you want, and you're putting God first. I will put away everything that I want right now. I'm gonna serve you. That's called faith, trusting the Lord. Listen to this, Colossians chapter three, verse 23 through 25. Put your heart and soul into every activity you do. You're sweeping, put your heart and soul into it. If you're getting coffee for somebody else, Put your heart and soul into it, but do this activity as though you were doing it, listen to this, for the Lord himself and not merely for other people. For we know that we will receive a reward and inheritance from the Lord. As we serve the Lord Yahweh, the anointed one, a disciple will be repaid for what he has learned and followed. For God pays no attention to the titles and the prestige of men. You understand that? You're not gonna get before the Lord and be like, but I was a boss. <laughs> but I had six figures. But I was able to buy this house and do these things. No, the Lord is gonna ask you, how did you serve me? And the most amazing thing you can hear from the Lord is well done, good and faithful servant. Isn't that crazy? That's what we all long to hear. The word servant, that you served me, that you believed in me. When everybody came against you, when everything was falling apart, you still served me with honor. So the Lord is saying, I will honor you in my kingdom for all eternity as well. And please notice this, okay? How does God work when it comes to promotion? Here's the answer. All Joseph had to do was wake up and be called because he was obedient to the Lord. All we had to do was wake up and be called in the right timing, meaning right now in your situation, as long as you follow the Lord, honor God, honor the leadership over you, one day you're gonna wake up because Joseph wasn't in control of anything. You see that, right? He's not in control of his destiny still. He couldn't force Pharaoh to have this dream. All these things were done by the hands of God behind the scenes. But he woke up one day in the prison and the next day he's gonna wake up in the palace. Isn't that amazing? You could wake up one day with your heart broken and wake up the next day with it completely healed. You could wake up one day with your marriage falling apart and wake up the next day knowing that God just restored it and did a miracle. You could wake up one day with anxiety and fear over bills, over finances. And the next day, wake up knowing that God has provided everything you need and more. This is the goodness of God when you walk in obedience. But this also leads to my, my second point, which is this. You have been given power by God to save people. You have been given power by God not to boast about yourself, not to say, hey, look at me and what I have, but you've been given power and authority by God to save people, to help people. That's why God placed it in your hands. Okay, let me ask you this question. Why did Pharaoh need Joseph's help? To do what? To interpret his dreams, right? Which means the first way Joseph saved Egypt, here it is, was by hearing from God. Let's make it very simple. The first way he saved an entire nation was by hearing the voice of the Lord. Remember, Joseph said, I cannot interpret your dreams, but my God can. He can give you the answers to what you need right now. It's amazing when you hear the voice of God, it changes everything. It is so important. There's gonna be people in your life that have fear and anxiety. Remember, Pharaoh was distressed over his dream, but the moment Joseph spoke an interpretation, the truth that came from the Lord, it set him at ease. It gave peace upon his mind. Are you anxious right now? Are you fearful? Are you scared? Pray to the Lord. We ask 
everybody else. We ask Google more than we ask God, right? We ask people about relationships that have had like five failed relationships on what to do. We ask friends on what we should do about our life. We don't even know where they're going, what they're doing. But are you asking the Lord? Because when the Lord gives you an answer, it's always to save you. Listen to what Jesus said in Mark chapter four, verse 24. Jesus said, pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given and you will receive even more. The more you listen, the more you understand what the Lord is speaking over your life, you will receive even more understanding of what to do, no matter what the problem looks like. I said last week, if you're led by the Holy Spirit, you've been called to be a problem solver. Not afraid of the problems before you, but to be a problem solver because my Lord always has the answer. Every single time. Y'all about to get me worked up now. Okay, let's keep going. But you speak peace into a person's life when you hear from the Lord, okay? What were the dreams? The first dream is seen in Genesis 41, verses 17 through 20. Pharaoh said, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile River and I saw seven fat, healthy cows come up out of the river and began grazing in the marsh grass. But then I saw seven sick looking cows, scrawny and thin, uh, come up after them. I like how this is worded. I've never seen such sorry looking animals in the land of Egypt. These thin scrawny cows ate the seven fat cows. Now, most of us would say, man, what did I eat last night? You know, I ate a lot of candy or pizza and it messed with my mind. But we're about to get to it. But Joseph understood symbolism. Remember the very first sermon of this series that God spoke to him in dreams with symbols to grab his attention to seek the Lord. He understood these symbols. Verses 22 through 24 is a second dream. Uh, Pharaoh said, in my dream, I also saw seven heads of grain, full and beautiful, growing on a single stalk. The seven more heads of grain appeared, but these were blighted, shriveled, and withered by the east wind. And the shriveled heads swallowed the seven healthy heads. First of all, Joseph recognized that this was from the Lord because of the symbolism that was in the dream. And so he understood the meaning because he asked he asked the father. He asked God what the meaning to the dream was. And then he tells them, listen, both dreams had the same meaning. There's gonna be seven years of prosperity upon the land of Egypt. That's the fat cows, okay? The good stock. But after seven years of prosperity, there's gonna be seven years of famine. That's why the skinny cows, the ugly ones, are coming and eating up the good ones. It's gonna be so bad, you're gonna forget the prosperity that we used to have. So then he says, it's time to take action. Now, what I love though is that you could already see a major difference in the character of Joseph. Because in the very beginning of the story, when he received dreams about himself, what did he say to his brothers? He said, the Lord said, you're gonna bow down to me. It was all about himself. You see that, right? In the beginning, he thought it was all about him. He was just excited for the position and that people would bow down to him. But now in this case, because he's been humbled over time, because he's been through a lot, he's wording but he's speaking more with wisdom. And he's understanding that what the Lord is showing Pharaoh is actually good advice to save the land of Egypt. It's to save other people as well. Now, he also knew it was from the Lord. I love verse 32. I gotta talk about this, okay? This verse has always fascinated me. Genesis chapter 41, verse 32. He said, Pharaoh, you had two dreams about the same thing. That means God wanted to show you that he really will make this happen and he will make it happen soon. Listen to what Joseph said. He said, you had two dreams back to back, same meaning, went together. The Lord is grabbing your attention. God is doing this twice to grab your attention because if you had one crazy dream, mm, I don't know what's going on. But if you had it again, and it continues, this is actually called the law of the double dream. God will give you a dream, he will speak to you. You can wake up from this dream, go back to sleep and the dream will continue. I've even had testimonies of people tell me that they had a dream from the Lord and they prayed to God, okay, God, is this really from you? Help me to understand. And even a month later, they received another dream that fulfilled the first one. In fact, let me share it like this. This is how we believe this building is gonna become ours. Let me make it very clear. I did not pick this building. I did not pick this building. We believe God picked this building. One of our elders had a dream 
and he was inside of this building. Construction was going on. Things were being put in place and he saw it coming together. And then he woke up from the dream he literally went back to sleep. And when he went back to sleep, the dream continued. Here's what's so cool about the second half of the dream. The building was almost done. And this is a story that I read to you last week where my son was actually with him, helping him put books together, sending him out all over the country. It's amazing. But when he woke up from the dream, here's what happened. He immediately heard the address from the Lord. It was pressed upon his heart. Wasn't like this crazy audible voice in his room, but it was an address placed upon his heart over a building he hadn't been to in years. He goes to the building. Also, one other thing that he saw in the dream. In the first dream, he saw a red couch in that building. When he went up to the building, now I do not have this on the, the screen behind me, but this sign was actually on the door of the building. Here's what it says. God, we thank you for our success and know that nothing is possible without you. We ask that you give all those that pass through these doors the wisdom, strength, and grace to make wise decisions and the angels in heaven to protect us as we work. We dedicate this building to you. And we ask that you bless it for generations to come. All the praise is given to you. The Lord showed us this building to fulfill this prayer right here to bless the generations to come. I told you also in the dream, he saw a red couch. When he looked in the building, the only thing he saw was a, a red couch. It's amazing what the Lord can do. And sometimes we play things off. We don't care because we think it's just a silly dream. Listen, God confirmed it twice to show that this is true. This building behind me, I believe fully the Lord placed it in our lives. It is a destination to reach more people in the city of Hickory. God has big plans. One of the dreams over the building that one of our um, secretaries had is that she was actually booking people too, flying in and staying at the hotels around the building because so many people would travel just to be a part of the story of what God is doing. God has picked this building. Now, second is this. Joseph not only heard from the Lord to save the land of Egypt, but the second thing is this, he was given power to save people by giving them a plan of action. Now we know the story, so we know that they had to take action, but I really want you to see this. He heard a dream and said, okay, let's prepare. How many of you would do that? If you had a dream about cows <laughs> and you woke up and said, all right, all right, now we gotta prepare them. Many of us would play it off, but he knew the dream was from the Lord, but he has to take action. This is faith because right now the land of Egypt had everything they needed. There was no famine in the land. In fact, there would not be famine for after seven years. They trusted the Lord in this moment. And so he had a plan of action because he heard from God on what to do. Genesis 41 verses 47 through 49. During the seven good years, the crops in Egypt grew very well. Joseph saved the food in Egypt during those seven years and stored the food in the cities. And every city, and every city had stored grain that grew in the fields around the city. Joseph stored so much grain that it was like the sands of the sea. He had success. He had the position, but I also need you to understand he could have just taken care of himself. It could have been like, all right, these things are happening. Let me just make sure that I'm good. But the Lord told him to save to save, to save other people. Let me also say it like this, how you handle success speaks loudly about your character. I'm telling you, the most challenging test you can have in your life over your character, over your heart, is when you actually step in the position where you still give God the credit, where you still have a heart for other people. Let me ask you this question too. Let's Let's go into a theological conversation here. Where does true power come from? Where does true power come from? It comes from God. It comes from above, right? But the devil has tried to twist this within our culture and try to confuse the minds of many saying that he has the same power of God and he can give you everything that you want. We see this in the temptation of Jesus when he's fasting in the desert 40 days and 40 nights and Satan says, literally, I can give you anything if you bow down and worship me. But all that Satan gives is a counterfeit of the real thing. It's fake. He doesn't truly have power. Jesus said, I watched Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He was kicked out of heaven. He does not have the same power as 
me. That's what Jesus was saying. Power belongs to God. Psalms chapter 62, verse 11. God has spoken once, twice I heard this. Notice again, twice. Confirmation is all over the word of God. Twice I heard this, that power belongs to God. And one of my favorite conversations on this subject is between Pilate and Jesus. I want you to listen to this. In John chapter 19, verses eight through 11, Pilate took Jesus back to the headquarters again, and he asked him, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. He said, why don't you talk to me? Pilate demanded. Don't you realize, Pilate said this, that I had the power to crucify you or let you go? I had the authority to kill you or set you free, yet you will not speak to me. Remember last week? We said that sometimes silence is also spiritual maturity. When you have false accusations coming your way, when people try to condemn you or control you, silence can be the best way to get them back. Anybody married in the room? You ever been through the silent treatment? And it gets awkward over time. You're like, dude, today, do we talk? Do we, do we wave down the hall? Like, I don't know what to do right now. There's no rules to this because you're not talking to me in this moment. Silence can drive you insane and drive you crazy, but silence can also speak louder than words. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy by remaining silent due to the accusations, but also silence proved that Jesus was not intimidated by Pilate's power. You see that, right? Pilate was scared of Jesus. Pilate was actually scared of the crowd. In fact, he is begging Jesus to tell him what to do so that he can let him go instead. Now listen to the words of Jesus here. Jesus did speak in verse 11. And Jesus said, you would have no power over me at all unless it were given to you from above. The position you have right now over me has been given to you by my father. And he's allowing it right now for his will. Maybe God is allowing some things in your life right now because his will for you is better in the end. But your character has to be tested and it's hard to remain silent. It's hard to trust in the promises of God sometimes, but here's what the devil doesn't want you to know about power. God has given every believer in Christ the power, also spiritual power to overcome the devil to overcome his demons. Every time you fight a spiritual battle and your mind feels taken by temptation, you can shout out in the name of Jesus, set me free. God, I don't wanna be this person anymore. Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus said to his disciples, look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. Remember, I spoke a while back that I had a dream about the building, in my dream. What I saw around the building, and I had a bird's eye view, I saw a lot of darkness around the building. And to be honest with you, I didn't really know the area too much at that time or what was past the building and, and some of the things that go on around there. So I just saw a lot of darkness. But all of a sudden, in my dream, I saw these light beams coming up from the building all the way to heaven. And it's like I heard in the dream, I just knew this, that that was the sound of pure, true worship of what the Lord was going to do there. And then I realized, and the Lord placed upon my heart, and I spoke it to the church, that God is also leading us to this building to change the area, to bring favor. Remember, we talked about favor. Favor changes the environment. God is bringing us there to change the lives of people around that area. And I heard from the Lord, not only would the building become beautiful, but the area would become beautiful as well. It would start to prosper and people's lives would be changed. We would even send out maybe buses and vans to bring people that weren't able to make it to church to come to church because guess what? We'll have room. <laughs> You won't have to sit in the lobby just to be here, but we'll be able to make more room for people to be impacted by the kingdom of God. We believe people will be traveling there as well. God show me that there's a light of pure worship that will come from this building and it will make the darkness weak. So pray. Because what God has called us to do is to take down dark principalities in this city. And I told my team this morning, you need to pray for the armor of God because demons love to be loud. They love to distract. They love to get in your head and put a lot of doubt in your mind over the promises that the Lord is doing. But I believe in every promise of God and we're gonna slay those demons in the name of Jesus Christ. 
We're gonna impact this city. And the Lord placed an even bigger vision on my heart. So starting this week and every year, this is going to increase. This is one of our first impacts. We, we, we partner with a lot of organizations in the area. We serve with them, but I'm ready to start giving back to these organizations. So this week, we were able to cut a check for $5,000 to the Pregnancy Care Center. Come on, come on. And I say that because of your generosity into this church. We're able to do this and we're already seeing what the Lord is doing. And this, for the Pregnancy Care Center, they're helping mothers in need. They're saving the lives of babies. They've been able to help 75 single mothers this year from domestic violence and sex trafficking. They've helped over 94 sexually assaulted victims in the past year, giving ongoing pregnancy support, providing mental health counseling, providing needs for babies. And in just this year, they have shared the gospel around 218 women who now know they can run to the arms of Jesus. We were able to cut them a check for $5,000. And here's what I'm more excited about. Over the years, I see us giving away 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, even $100,000 to the organizations here in Hickory, changing lives, serving with them, but also giving with them as well. This is a vision that God is igniting in this house, in this church. And so I wanna say thank you for believing in the vision, believing in the promises and being excited about all that God is doing. God picked this building and he picked our destination. This leads to my last point, okay? Now, this may be the hardest one. All good things come from above. All good things come from God, right? This also means that you are not the owner, but you are the manager of what God has given you. If all good things have been placed in your hand by God, guess what? It means that you are not the owner of what's been placed in your hands, but you are instead a manager of what God has given you. In the kingdom, it's not about getting more money. It's actually about getting more management because God owns the money. Everything that comes from above, okay? And he will only allow you to have, listen, what you will manage properly. Listen to what Jesus said. In Luke chapter 16, verse 11 and 12, he said, if you have not handled the riches of the world with integrity, why should you be trusted with the eternal treasures of the spiritual world? And if you're not proving yourself faithful with what belongs to another, why should you be given wealth of your own? Let me say it another way. God was saying, if you are not faithful with what has been handed to you by God, why should you be given more? And this really hit me because I've always been honest in this area of my life. I grew up really struggling with giving back and tithing. I always had the mindset that when I make more money, then I'll start giving. That's a lie. That's a lie from the enemy. And I wasn't managing well at all what the Lord had been placing in my life. In fact, it carried along um, all the way into me being a pastor as well. I struggled with it. The first church that I worked at as a pastor, I was not giving over to the Lord. And I remember being so convicted because I honored the Lord, I praised him, and I believed him for everything else. But when it came to my money, I wouldn't trust him. And it hurt me. And I remember one night I had just enough money for some bills and some things that we needed. And again, that was mismanagement on my part. But the Lord said, it's time to give. Trust me. And I remember that night in my house online, I gave a certain amount. And, and again, it's like I wrestled it the whole way. There was, there was spiritual warfare going on in my mind, in my heart, in my faith. But immediately when I gave it over to the Lord, I was like, man, This feels freeing, but I still didn't know how I was gonna pay some bills because I needed every penny. And then that morning, I kid you not, I show up to church and this older man grabs my hand and says, hey, come over here real quick. And I said, okay. And he said, look, I don't know what's going on, but the Lord told me to give you this. And it was half of what I've given the night before. I mean, I was so surprised. It was early in the morning. Like I still had eye boogers and everything. I'm like, God, I haven't even like fully woken up and you're already blessing me with half. And I remember sitting in the congregation now and be like, God, thank you so much. And this other guy looks at me and goes, hey. I'm like, God, what are you about to do? And he says, this is weird. But God told me to give you this and it was the other half. What breaks me about this story is I didn't deserve it. 
I didn't have to do that because I had been rebelling against the Lord for too long. And God convicted me and I did the right thing one night and the Lord blesses me like that. I didn't deserve that blessing. But because he's a good father who wanted to teach me a lesson that he provides all things. Don't be scared of what the Lord is telling you to do, even when it comes to money. Even when it comes to the scary things that seem impossible, God always makes a way when you trust him. Joseph obeyed the Lord, and I want you to see this. In Genesis 47, 24 through 26, here's what he did. He said, then when you harvest it, one-fifth of your crops, 20% will belong to Pharaoh. You may keep the remaining four-fifths as seed for your fields and as food for you, your household, and your little ones. And they said, you have saved our lives. May it please you, my Lord, to let us be Pharaoh's servants. Now listen to this. Joseph then issued a decree still in effect in the land of Egypt that Pharaoh should receive one-fifth of all the crops grown on his land. Listen, only the land belonging to the priest was not given to Pharaoh. This is not an Egyptian practice. This is an Israeli practice of tithing, of giving right here. But it blessed the land. He was blessing the land of Egypt. The favor of the Lord came from obedience because he heard a dream. He listened to the Lord's voice and he was able to save what belonged to God and the rest was redeemed. And so I realized in our lives, listen, sometimes we do this too. In our life, we're like, all right, God, I know that you can pour so much blessing in my life. Everything you have for me, I'm ready for it. And God's like, okay, I do love you. There's things I want you to have. There you go. We don't always say a lot of times, God, this is it. So-and-so has, has more than me. So-and-so has that, that position over there and I wish that I had that. So God, just give me more right now. And God sees your character is not big enough to handle more yet. And if I gave you everything you wanted, guess what's gonna happen? Because you haven't learned how to be a good manager of what I've given you. Everything just becomes a mess in your life instead of order. Meaning your character is not ready for all the blessings I could pour upon you today. But when it's ready, it will be the right timing. But if you rush the process, if you have pride in your position and what you have, you're gonna make a mess and it won't be the same. And everything that I'm doing in your life can start to fade. That's grace. That's the goodness of God in our life. I wanna end by, by saying this. God should never be second place in your life. He will always come first. No matter what, he will always be first. Matthew 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything that you need. Put first the kingdom of God and then your life is placed in order. But if you get that order out of whack and put other things before God, guess what? Confusion takes place. Depression takes place. Separation takes place. These things start to take place in your own life instead of believing in his promises. And here's a real revelation about giving and tithing. This is, this is so powerful. I need you to understand that in the scripture, God said the firstborn is mine. He declared it to be his. Exodus 13, one and two. The first offspring is to be born of both human and animals belongs to me. It belongs to the Lord. Your livestock, the firstborn, this was their wealth, their money. The very first belonged to the Lord. But guess what? Jesus is also the firstborn of creation. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And then I noticed something else. Uh, the first fruits belong to the Lord. This is what we see in the story of Cain and Abel. Isn't it funny that Cain held back for himself, yet he was jealous of Abel's favor? Because he wasn't giving the Lord his first fruits. He was holding back. Exodus 23, verse 19, as you harvest your crops, bring the very best of the first harvest to the house of the Lord, your God. But did you know that Jesus is also the first fruits according to the word of God? 
1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and he has become our first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And God is saying, listen, trust me. Give me what is mine. The timber set belongs to my house and I will redeem the rest because I need you to understand God gave his firstborn. Jesus Christ was the Father's tithe to us. Jesus Christ is the tithe of the Lord to redeem us and restore us. Romans 5 verse 8, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us, not when we had everything perfect, not when we put our life in order, not when we thought we were good enough, but while we were still sinners, he gave his only son to die for our sins, to redeem us and restore us. And so here's the revelation. It is the same way with what authority God has placed in your hands, including your wealth. The 10% belongs to the Lord and God will redeem the rest but he's teaching you to trust him. I'm telling you, I've been there. I trusted the Lord with so many other things except that area of my life. And I realized I could never step into the position or my purpose until my character in that area changed. And believe it or not, for me, when I did the year of evangelism and I didn't get a paycheck for an entire year, that's the year I really started tithing consistently. And God always provided everything that I needed. He will always provide for you because he loves you. This world cannot provide for you the way my God can. And he will speak to you and he will help you. But listen to this. Can I have you stand right here? I'm asking our prayer team to come up front because I get it. Some of us, we struggle with this. I used to get antsy with this subject, but I want you to hear that this is not coming from me. This is coming from the word of the Lord. But listen to the blessings that I want you to understand in Malachi chapter three, verse 10 and 11, bring all the tithes, the tenth, into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. This is what the Lord is saying. It is the only verse out of the entire Bible where God says, test me in this. Test me, give to my storehouse and see if I would not open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you so great a blessing until there is no more room to receive it. Then I will rebuke the devourer, the insects, the plagues that come after your crops, after your livestock. I will rebuke them for your sake. I will put a hedge of protection upon your family. I will show you my love. I will work behind the scenes so that even when you think everything is just normal and good, I'm still fighting a spiritual battle just for you because you trusted the Lord. I told you at the very beginning of this sermon, God is gonna break us today with this sermon. I'm telling you, it's one of those sermons that it's hard to hear, but we need it because I'm telling you, the purity test is hard. The provision test is hard. The believe the impossible test, it's all hard. But I believe the hardest test is to overcome your pride when you finally step into the position of success. And to trust the Lord instead. Will you use what God has given you to save people? Well done, my faithful servant. And so right now we talked about a lot of different things. Have you let go of a promise that the Lord has spoken over your life? And you need to ask somebody to pray over you today to place a word in your heart. Remember a word from the Lord, hearing from God can bring healing upon your life. Or maybe there's something you're holding on to that God is telling you to let go. Maybe you're not happy with where you are right now. Maybe this is how you feel. God, you promised me something bigger, but you're giving me this. Help me to keep believing and not give up on the promise because those voices are loud and they're coming up against me. Maybe that's you today. Or maybe God is speaking to you the same way he spoke to me. It's time to be obedient in an area of your life and submit it over to the Lord. 
Hey guys, this is Pastor Bobby Chandler, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. I also want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. So we love our Authentic family and thank you today for joining us.